Thank you for joining us today to Misunderstanding Cloud Native. Happy to be here in front of you. I am Anna, currently working as a developer advocate for Red Hat, and together with me today is... My name is Rustam. I uh, work as a, a chief engineer in a company called Computas in, in Norway, Oslo. And I'm um, very happy to be here, very happy to be back in Barcelona, and I was just debating with Anna whether we should say good morning to you all or not. It's still 11 o'clock, so I guess good morning, people. <laughs> all right, so um, a little bit of a disclaimer. So I mean, all of the things that we'll be talking about today is a kind of, uh, it has a one very, very, very short answer to a lot of things. And those, that answer is probably the, the one that we've given ourselves, everyone pr probably in this room, and it depends. And it's kind of true. And, but the thing is, you will see that a lot of things will definitely depend on your situation, your things that you'll be doing, how you're doing, what you're doing, and all these kind of things. But, you know, um, we'll try to go deeper and explain something past this it depends thing, right? And um, again, before we start, it's a kind of a little bit of a disclaimer is that, you know, every decision that you make, everything that we'll advise you to consider doing, uh, has some kind of pros and cons. So there is no silver bullet. As, as everybody knows, there is no like one definite solution for everything, and everything will be peachy afterwards. So, I mean, it's not going to be like that. So let's go uh, into... So the, the, talk, the title of this talk is Misunderstanding Cloud Native. And what is actually cloud native? So we we would like to start with something that you're probably not supposed to do, or most definitely not supposed to do in a presentation, because I probably already lost half of you trying to parse that wall of text in there. But that is actually the, the real definition of uh, cloud native applications and what it is. But to distract you from reading that, and also to help you parsing that, we have highlighted a few uh, important words here. And to help you even more, we have decided to remove all the other words, because you don't need them. That's filling words. So the, the important ones are the ones you see now on the screen. And then you see like what we're actually trying to do. We're trying to build scalable applications, you know, we're running on private, public, private, or hybrid clouds, um, containers, service meshes, you know, all these kind of things. And and, and there are some words like loosely coupled, resilient, manageable, observable. And, you know, right now it's a bit of a mess, but we have another thing for you. So now it makes a bit more sense, right? It's the same definition. We removed all the filler words. We have highlighted the important things, and we also kind of tried to separate it. But what you're trying to achieve how are you going to do that? And why on earth do you want to do that? I mean, what's the point of the whole thing? Right? And so now we can see that we want to build scalable applications. We want them to be able to run on public, private, or hybrid clouds. Uh, we want to use uh, container service meshes, uh, things like microservices, image infrastructure, declarative APIs, and all that. And this is how we do it. And why would we do that? And well, why? Because, you know, loosely coupled is good. We've been told it's good, and we've seen it's good. Resilient is definitely good. Manageable, observable, and all these kind of things. So um, <clears throat> let's, uh, now that we have a definition, now we should uh, talk a little bit more about cloud native. And what does it mean? Does it mean do we have to deploy all, all our apps to the cloud? That's the only way, Anna? What do you think? What do you, what do you say? Well, if you're looking to the definition, well, it seems like, um, firstly, we should focus on building applications that are modern and they're scalable. Uh, and as deployment location can be anything that's public, private, or a hybrid. But the common misunderstanding that exists in our world that cloud means public cloud. Um, however, it's not necessarily to deploy in a public cloud to build cloud native applications. So you're not missing anything if you're deploying on a private or you're having uh, something that's deployed in hybrid infrastructure. Speaking about the what, like, 
uh, building scalable applications that are deployed on different clouds? Well, uh, as said earlier, clouds can be public or private. Uh, can be multi-clouds, so if you have applications that can be deployed on, uh, de on multiple providers, typically your application is deployed on multiple public clouds. This is how the multi-cloud is being uh, seen. Or you can go with hybrid, meaning you're combining cloud and on-prem. Maybe you have some data centers that you would like to be reused. Um, deploy a stack that's more modern in terms of infrastructure and add a little bit of public cloud for what can be deployed as public. And again, you're building cloud-native scalable applications. Now, when choosing a cloud offering, you should choose, um, for example, a cloud offering that matches your workload. And in this slide, you have a decision that's based on the amount of resources. So um, a public cloud offering gives you, um, is a better choice if your um, workloads have demands that oscillate in time. So if you are not sure on how your, the workload will be in time, going public might be a good option. But if you can predict the resources needed by our applications, then going private can help you as well. And also private clouds are great if you like working for organizations that are really, really preoccupied on security and having a lot of things under control. And thirdly, if you can partially predict what your application needs, hybrid clouds can be the best solution because they can host workloads anywhere. That's the idea of hybrid. Um, so now that we talked about clouds and their different options, let's talk about another misunderstanding or let's say fear in regards to cloud native, vendor lock-in. So Rustam, can you tell us a little bit more about what lock-in is and um, how can you stay away from it? Because it seems like something sure. scary. Sounds, uh, sounds like a good plan. Um, so what I haven't said when we started is that a lot of those things, it's not just something we came up with. It's actually things that we've seen out there. It could have been like I talked to some of our customers, some of our projects, and all this kind of thing. So vendor lock-in is one of those things that keeps uh, showing up and popping up in weird, weird, weird ways. Because like sometimes uh, people would just be like, oh, well, wait, we cannot use this managed database, even though it's based on open standards and everything. It's based on, say, I don't know, a Postgres or MySQL instance, but it's managed by somebody else. Oh, no, we cannot use that because that, will be a, uh, that would be a, um, a vendor lock-in. So we need to create a VM, install Postgres, same Postgres on it, and then run our things in that. So, uh, but, but, you know, and then you, you try to, to convince people that that might not be a g good idea. So let's talk about that. And... Uh, what does actually, actually a, a vendor lock-in means? So that means that you're using something that's very specific to that particular vendor. That means that porting that application will require a lot of rewriting. But if you're using open standards and open source software, even though it's been managed by somebody else, that should be fine. I mean, if it's a standard, I mean, since I use database example, we can might as well stick with it. So if it is a standard Postgres SQL instance or like installation or MySQL or something like that, at least it behaves in the same way, you should be fine. And you don't have the headache of managing. I mean, if you install that VM and if you run that thing on, uh, on a machine, so you have to manage the machine, manage the disks, manage the memory, manage the installation, manage the updates, manage the, like, a lot of things, and that gives you a lot of headache. I mean, okay, fine, you're portable. So, one, what are the chances that you're going to be moving? Two, how much will it actually cost you to, to rewrite your application? So, those two things is important to think about, and vendor lock-in is, you know, Maybe it's not that bad after all. Sometimes, if you can avoid it, perfect. If you cannot, well, think about things, about the costs, about the time, and all these kind of things. Um, so, let's talk about something else. Another misconception, a misunderstanding. Uh, that thing about, there's a lot of people talk about lift and shift, the way to migrate to the cloud, to come into, like, into the world of cloud and all this kind of thing. And what, what do you have to say about like, doing the lift and shift versus actually continuing development and making applications better and stuff? Oh, no. Well, um, here's the thing. Uh, when containers appeared, a lot of folks believe that you can containerize everything. doesn't matter how big it is. <laughs> 
um, and how stateful it is. Um, so uh, there's this common misunderstanding that if you containerize an app, that means you modernize it. Well, <laughs> yeah, you added containers, so you modernize it. But uh, lifting and shifting is intended to modernize minimally your application architecture. What you do in this case, you're actually replatforming what you already had. So yes, it's minimal impact on what you already built. You reuse your application code, that's great. Uh, but um, you will not, um, I don't know, experience the full modernization, I like to say. And in time, you will observe that probably, you, uh, well, you want to do more. But that gives you some time to like assess your situation and see that maybe you can refactor your application and um, plan more for uh, rewriting what is over there or replanning your architecture. Next, well, regarding lift and shift, how do you do lift and shift the proper way from our point of view and our experience? Well, uh, first of all, analyze the source code or existing artifacts of what you had built. Mm -hmm. Secondly, plan and estimate the work, at least a high level plan. And there are a lot of tools, by the way, that can help you uh, with uh, some built-in rules and migration paths. Of course, they're not gonna be perfect. But you can identify those migration issues based on your experience and you can evaluate the solutions. And then you can think about containerizing your existing application components while keeping the data and integration parties on the legacy side. So do not mm. move everything at once. Try to do it gradually. And typically, lift and shift is going to involve a platform as a service. So these are the traditional ways of, let's say, lift and shift. But there are other ways as well, like further development. Um, in between lift and shift and complete rewrite, there's a possibility to boost your application with new layers, meaning you wrap the existing legacy applications with new layers, APIs or interfaces, and again, you're deploying those on platform as a service, uh, typically. Mm. Now, the best thing that you know, excites most of the teams <laughs> is complete rewrite, because that's when you are rethinking how you did the things in the past, how you can develop them better, and how you can re-implement them using cloud-native technologies and, and features. So um, I've seen this many times, like rewriting is really nice, uh, but it actually becomes a little harder when you're actually getting to do it. Um, but always like focus that you're gonna make things better. So complete rewrites is the place. Thinking to... about rewrites is probably more exciting than actually doing the rewrites because by the time you've finished or by the time you've written your first line of code, you already created some technical depth and then the, some future people coming to your project start dreaming about re rewrites already then. So then, you know, that's a kind of never ending story really. But you know, it's, it's always fun to think about rewrites, you know, what ifs. And yeah, well, Rustam, now we talked about rewrites, and um, there's this new thing that's been for a new thing that has been for a while, yep. uh, serverless, like mm -hmm. no servers. Yeah, that's perfect, right? Yeah. You, you have your applications running, I mean, this is like, just think of the sentence, you have it running serverless in the cloud. If you said that sentence, I don't know, like 15 years ago, that would have been really fun, right? No servers and somewhere in the cloud. That's like, sounds almost like magic. But, you know, serverless is not really, I mean, we've probably learned that already by now. Uh, serverless is not really without servers. It's managed, it probably should have been called managedless. Uh, because, I mean, what is actually serverless? Well, serverless is a way of doing cloud-native development uh, that allows you to run applications so you don't have to manage them. So like, you know, like I said earlier, this managed database services, it's a kind of serverless database because, well, database is there, it runs on servers, but you don't have to think about managing that stuff. It's being upgraded and, you know, managed and partitioned and all that just for you in a, in a, in a kind of um, way, magical way. And that's nice, and um, <clears throat> then people start asking questions like this. It was like, okay, fine, serverless is cool, I'm kind of sold, but you know, do you have to put everything onto a cloud to make it serverless? Well, I mean, the question is, well, okay, if you look at what it actually is, so the technique enables us loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. 
So you don't have to move it onto the cloud. It doesn't have to be on the cloud. It can run and it should be able to run in a cloud in a loosely coupled way that gives you resilient, manageable, and observable applications. But it does not have to be on a public cloud. It could have been your private cloud. It could be something like, I don't know, uh, run on things like Knative. Quarkus has this thing called Funky. There are different other ways of creating uh, serverless functions. And the other thing is, a lot of people think about serverless as a function, a serverless function with a tiny little piece of code. But now we have things that can actually run full containerized applications, like a managed versions of Knative and so on, the Cloud Run, and things like that, that can actually do these things for you in a bit, bit bigger chunks than just tiny little functions. Another thing is that people ask, is like, do you have to run it on a specific cloud, insert any cloud provider in there? And um, the, again, the answer is no. And the answer is it depends where you have all your other loads. It depends what you want to do. It depends what kind of serverless you're after. I mean, are you after a serverless a data warehouse, or you're after a serverless running tiny little container, or you're after it running a tiny little snippet of code serverless? So. It depends. And um, there is always ways to, to evolve your implementation, right? So you can actually always do, th you should always do things. And now I'm talking not only about serverless, but in general. Like you should do things like infrastructure as code. So, and um, infra by infrastructure as, uh, as code, I mean things like Terraform, like Pulumi and everything, where you write code that creates all that. because. It will help you in many ways. It will automate a lot of builds. It will also automate creation of um, new clusters or new development platform uh, environments or new environments in general. Or it can also be a very, very useful thing for disaster recovery. If something goes down, if everything burns down to, for some kind of reason, you lose network connectivity, you just run one script or a set of scripts, go grab a coffee, come back, everything is up and running. So that's also a nice thing. So you don't have to, don't do click ops, basically. Right, um, and when you're when you're planning to deploy things on Kubernetes, uh, so you should have a look at Knative, which is built on Kubernetes on top of Kubernetes on top of Istio, and then you have Knative on top of that. All right, um, can I run it locally? Well, yes, you can because you're still running. Now we're back into the world of serverless. So can I actually run things serverless? In, uh, locally, well, yes, you can. Uh, there are different emulators. There are d different like CLI clients. Um, there is uh, well, uh, Open Hat, uh, Open ha uh, oh, Red Hat, not Open Hat. Okay, Red Hat has OpenShift sandbox um, that can do that kind of things, and there are several other emulators and stuff like that that will help you with uh, things like that. So you can run it locally, and you probably should run it locally first to make sure it actually behaves the way you want before you push it to the cloud. So um, I mentioned Kubernetes. We probably need to talk more about that. Do it yourself, Kubernetes service platform, because all the cool kids are running Kubernetes, and all of the cool kids pretend, I mean, all the big ones are saying that they're running Kubernetes themselves, right? So we should do that. Our tiny little startup of three people doing 24-7 development, we should create our Kubernetes cluster and make it run there, everything, right? Uh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, no, on a serious no note here. Um, Do-it-yourself Kubernetes service platform uh, sounded like really an, a nice thing to do. When Kubernetes appeared as a platform, given its simplicity and um, the way that it was uh, thought to evolve, it gave the impression that it's quite easy to manage Kubernetes um, and Kubernetes clusters. Mm -hmm. However, many teams realized down the road that it's not as easy to manage the clusters, uh, and it's not just you know doing deployments and relying on the platform features for everything to go smoothly for the rest of the days of uh, the cloud-native applications. Now, the do-it-yourself Kubernetes story, in short, it's summarized like this for each cluster, and there are many, many more stuff to be done. Now, first of all, you need deployment tools like Kubet or Kubespray to like um, form the canvas. 
then you have to configure for high availability, backup and restore the ADCD where you're storing your configurations and, and all that. Uh, if you're doing these things yourself, uh, it's, it's gonna be like really a burden when you have multiple clusters. Then you have to create and manage multiple control plane systems. You have to manage certificates, you have to manage secrets. You have to configure external load balancers for the API server, and you have to manage network policies, ingress and egress, and a lot of other fun stuff. And then upgrades of Kubernetes versions come, and you have to do this, well, look at this all over again, and look at what has been invented in the platform, what to add, what to take care of uh, when moving forward your, your platform. So pretty much the moral of the story, do you really want to do that? Um, Anyone? So, Anyone? No? Come. No one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we talk afterwards. Uh, so here's the thing. Why you should necessar not necessarily do that and probably rely on a cloud provider is because you need to do that with combined with robust automation because that's what CNCF told us that it should we should build cloud native applications that are, you know are automated and we have like pretty much we're not very involved as humans to manage those so um, to make high impact changes frequently mm -hmm. we need help from robust automation and if you're like thinking of doing that on your on your own, you pretty much need a very big team. So like you asked me in the beginning, small. three people, startup. No? Yeah, if you don't <laughs> want to. Well, I mean, the, the answer is actually it, it depends because I mean, if you have like super specific kind of application that needs to be running on Kubernetes, that's totally fine. Just don't do it because everybody else is doing because I don't know, say Netflix or Google does that. Well, I mean. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, they have a little bit different kind of traffic that most of the applications out there, right? So maybe they need that. Maybe you should, you know, think about it a couple of times before you do that. And the other thing is that, you know, uh, it's the, the key word here, if we just go one, the last yellow thing there, minimal toil. If, if all that brings you more happiness in life and brings you minim less toil than it used to be, fine, do it. If not, maybe you should consider doing something else. Yeah, well, um, and then uh, a lot of people believe that just putting your application in Kubernetes, um, then your application is modernized, um, and that's it. Uh, end of the story, everything is modernized and is working as like a charm. However, uh, we can talk afterwards, there's a place about lessons learned with mm. Kubernetes. Uh, that describe different use cases and experiences, and you can find out lessons learned when Kubernetes was not exactly the best choice for teams when going forward. So um, just because others did it maybe in the same industry, it doesn't mean it will work for you uh, as well. So always take, um, always look at this, uh, look at your use cases and choose what's best for, um, for your application, actually for your team's happiness, <laughs> because that's pretty much very important. Um, now let's talk a little bit about, well, we talked about Kubernetes, we talked about all these things with servers and everything, and talk about deployments. How about uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and this thing like scripting once, and works in the under condition, you create a pipeline that works forever and ever and never Rain touches. or shine, never changes. Well, I wish it was, but the thing is, it's not like that. And a lot of people, uh, again, it's, 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 it's out of the experience and it's, you will have like project managers or customers or whatever. It's like, oh, wait, why do you need to rewrite? Why do you need to do something to our CI CD pipeline? That was, we spent some like previous sprints, we did that, now it should be working, right? And then you're like, oh, well, you know, there was a new version of that, a new thing of this, and we added new uh, new service here that's using some other thing, and when you were pulling from something else, and we had to rewrite our repository to something else, and well, you need to update all that. And, you know, that means that it's, it has to evolve, and it has to evolve organically. You'll start with something small, and it will grow as your project grows. And it's, again, if you think about uh, disaster recovery and things like that, that is also a very important part. Because, okay, say you have scripted and or you programmed your infrastructure with uh, whatever that is, Terraform, Pulumi, whatever. Uh, but now you need to deploy your code, and that should also be 
reproducible, automatic, and with minimal toil. And that is where all those CI, CD pipeline automation comes in, and you need to make sure that they work. If you run this pipeline, but you still have to do sm small tweaks here and there to make it work, this is not automated fully yet. It's probably better than doing everything manually, but you need to evolve, evolve, make it evolve gradually and organically and also keep grooming that thing all the time. So basically, you will need to spend time on that um, throughout the life of the project. And how you do that? It's not that, like I worked on a project where I was the delivery manager or like tech lead or whatever, and then I was kind of, given the golden key of the deployment. So whenever everybody was de like done stuff, they would run home, and then they would be like, okay, now it's going to, you can deploy it to the production, and then I would just sit there as like, and something fails, I have no idea what happened because somebody implemented something half an hour ago, and you know, they tested and it was fine, but now it's not. So shared responsibility is a good thing. Uh, pipelines evolve with features and, and processes, obviously, like we said already. Uh, merge to, to main as often as possible. I mean, we all, probably a lot of us are into sci-fi movies and you know, superheroes movies. They're very, very big fans of like parallel timelines and stuff like that. Let's keep it there. Do not bring that into a Git. Like you have parallel timelines of the Git branches and merges. That is, that is not as spectacular as it is in the movies. So. Don't do that. Uh, merge as often as possible. Uh, run automated tests, quick feedbacks. You know, all these kind of things is very, very, very good ideas and should be done. I'm not saying you have to do all that at once, but you should have it at least as a kind of uh, aim or you know way to go where you where you want to go. Frequent small deployments and not only to production, because the, if you use other environments, you will actually use more, uh, you will see errors much earlier. You will use all those environments in a proper way. All right, so observability. And this is fun part. I mean, this is the important part here. I mean, we kind of can agree that observability is cool. But the misunderstanding is this after thing. So observability after reaching production, right? That's 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 only yeah, thing we yeah. have to watch, right? Yeah, and I pr yeah. <laughs> so after we, we reach production, that's when we start to observe a system and see if it actually is as performant as we promised to make it. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing is that, well, just to give a definition, observability is the ability to measure the system's current state based on the data it generates, such as logs, metrics, and traits. Um, and um, it, for some situations, observability was not something addressed early when building a system uh, because people are focused on building something um, and delivering that something and thinking afterwards like, uh, and now we have to prove that it actually meets uh, those uh, non-functional requirements and uh, yeah, it does that. Uh, so observability, it should be something that you're doing along the way, not after you reach production and you would like to make the system observable. So uh, to make a system observable, um, use instrumentation tools and instrumentation methods, including open source tools. And take a look at open telemetry because it contains both uh, practices and tools that you can use uh, to do that. All the time, you should collect logs, metrics, traces. And something that probably many of you didn't or some of you don't necessarily think of, user feedback. Now, I'm not saying to survey the users like, hey, are you happy with this? Uh, is everything going OK? Uh, that can be an option. But you can see the user feedback in terms of um, you know, the interaction and based on the analytics uh, of certain areas of your, um, of your application and how that, um, how that went. Meaning, if people gave up on doing certain steps at some some point because it was too difficult, um, and many more things. So always like correlate uh, the things that you can see in the tools, and um, you can like you know measure, but also take into account the user feedback, uh, meaning clicks and all all the other stuff down the road, because that is important as well uh, when observing how well your application is behaving. Yes. I have one little thing that, w w if you're done with that slide. Yes, okay. I'm done with that slide. Uh, so uh, w w to this slide, I want to add this thing. So now that we kind of hopefully 
if we, if we imagine that we migrated to the cloud, we have things running on some kind of cloud and stuff like that, now we can actually use the power, the, 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 the positive and po the pros of the cloud. So when things start failing, you don't have to, now you have load balancers and stuff like that, most likely, because a lot of clouds uh, will provide you in one way or another. You, you have ways of split trafficking, uh, uh, yeah, tr splitting the traffic. And then you can do things like uh, different kinds of deployment and all that. So say things are starting to fail. You don't have to, like, in full panic, re roll back to the previous uh, version of application for everyone and just like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, what happened? You can actually do split, the splits. You split the traffic, you, s you move 95% of, uh, of your users to something that works, and then you keep a little bit of amount of users on that to collect more metrics, to collo collect a lot more logs, to understand what's actually happening, and do not like, try to debug that later in blindness. So you know, th those kind of things will actually make it even better, right? Yeah. So Rustam is talking about canary deployments. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> canary deployments, a maybe um, um, AB, te yeah. AB testing and, yes, and all yes, that, yes. yeah. Well, uh, A-B testing can be used for different things, but yes, yes that's true. Yes, A-B testing yeah. and, uh, yeah, and so no, blue-green blue deployment, sorry. Yes, I but A-B testing, your UX people in your team will love them. Yeah. Um, now we talked about, you know, deployments and all these other stuff. Um, there's also something that's pretty much chased nowadays because we don't want to overuse resources and we want to pay attention to how much it costs to maintain an application up and running. So we're always thinking about um, choosing two stuff with our application. Okay, zero downtime, it's important because we don't want our end users to feel that they cannot do something with our applications at some point in time. So that's really, really mm -hmm. impacting. But scale to zero obsession is another thing that came into the scenery <laughs> nowadays with the cloud native application. So um, zero downtime, let's start with the first one. Uh, the zero downtime is achievable, but uh, you have to really, you know, uh, ponder a little bit how you're going to achieve the, the zero downtime. The default deployment strategies in Kubernetes as well as rolling update, um, but uh, if um, you should also pay attention when you are doing the rolling updates, like if you should have a graceful shadow and a fast start of your containerized application. If your application takes a lot of time to restart or to when it needs to scale, it, it starts again and it takes like a couple of seconds to do that, then it's not very, very pleasant. So it's not time utilized properly. Mm -hmm. um, how you can make sure that your application really starts faster and you're helping it to be uh, even better when it comes to scaling uh, and not only. You can pay attention to the size of your container image. That's why compiling to native is a solution because you get a smaller container image and you don't necessarily depend on having a specific uh, runtime or JVM or, or anything else. Uh, but also you should pay attention to health probes customization. Um, it's, um, it's good to assess your dependencies with the health probes, for example. Um, but um, always pay, pay attention, like if you really need to as, uh, assess with your probes um, all of your dependencies, because there are situations when your application can still provide a certain satisfactory answer to the end users, uh, while probably one of your dependencies is not working as expected. And the thing with health probes, you can actually know, I mean, if you set them up correctly, you will know before things go bad. You, you will know a little bit earlier. You can see kind of into the future. Yeah. Now, speaking about scale to zero, because that's um, a much more recent thing. Scale to zero was like, well, let's not use uh, CPU and memory um, for an application that's probably not, not used anymore. Mm -hmm. However, in a distributed system, that's unlikely. You have built something to be used. OK, maybe it's not as frequently used as other parts. But you should not necessarily think that uh, it should become unavailable at a certain point in time. But if you really want to go to scale to zero, again, think about the size of the container image because, well, when your container needs to start again, mm -hmm. it will take into account that. Um, then look about the Knative service configuration. You can like help. Um, typically, scale to zero is more achievable with Knative. Um, and of course, reevaluate your auto-scaling conditions 
uh, in order to improve this. So it's not necessarily that you need scale to zero, but maybe auto-scaling works just fine for your application. And also the size, it's not only the size of a container, but it's also how much time it actually takes for it to start. If the size of a container is tiny, but your app is using like five minutes to start, eh, that's probably you need to rewrite your application to be able to respond quicker. If you're going to scale to zero, it, you will need the cold start. You will, you will need to minimize the time it takes for the cold start for the first request before it c comes in and it, it returns something. That's true. So. And we're up to the last slide. Um, we want to thank you for listening to us. We're welcoming questions now. Um, and I think there are some. We're going to get some There help were from. some questions, I think, In the online. Yeah. And uh, while we are looking for those, we can do live questions. Anyone, just raise up your hand. The microphone will appear in your hands magically. OK, so let's do the questions now for now from the interwebs. Almost. Yeah. Hello, hello. OK. Yes, we can hear We have you. one okay. in the web app. Uh, what's the biggest misconception, misunderstanding about cloud native you have come across? I think we can we can answer them like each. I guess our yeah. our answers will be a bit different. I guess. Yeah. Try. It will be a bit different. So when I started looking into the cloud native part, I pretty much didn't understand what being cloud native is, and I was fearing that I'm missing out something. Um, so I think the big part of misunderstanding what's cloud native is like the part with the cloud deployment. Mm. That's something that I've encountered really often. Like. Um, yeah, you're not cloud native unless you're on a public cloud. So that's something that I often encountered. And then it comes to um, how you're doing things in your team, how your how your practices are in the team, because you you read blogs and all these uh, cool stuff that others are doing in um, big teams with, let's say, Netflix, Google, and all yeah. all the uh, yeah. all the cool kids, um, <laughs> and you're fearing that. Probably what you're doing at work is, is, is not enough. But most mm -hmm. of the time, based on my experience, was the fact that um, it was not deployed on a public offering. Mm. Yeah, uh, I've seen a few. I mean, I've seen one. One thing is where you, uh, where you basically take your monolith off an elephant application, you shove it all into a tiny little container, and when you kind of manage to close the door of the container of that little elephant in there, a big elephant, uh, it, you're just like, ooh, we're containerized. And then you kind of continue misusing the whole idea of containerization where you end up SSHing into your containers and doing stuff in there. It's like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna build this container, and to start another thing, we just SSH and run this command and do this, and then, and then to upgrade it, we SSH into it again and upgrade some. So, so it's like, you know, use, Containers are kind of one use utility kind of, you know, forks and knives and plates and stuff that we have. You use it once, you build it once. When it's over, it's over. You throw it away, you build another one. So, you know, this kind of thing and one is one. The other one that I mentioned is the, um, the lock-in, kind of fear of lock-in for at all prices. And then you ended up creating a horrible, bad solutions to avoid lock-in and kind of digging yourself even deeper into the pro like the, 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 the problems. And well, and I think or, it's also with, yeah, go ahead. Or worse, uh, waiting for something else to be invented or like delaying a decision. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to, to go with uh, a, an um, already built-in solution by a certain provider because the time, let's say, not the time wasted not delivering something for the end users um, is way much more hurtful for the business than yeah. actually building something and figuring out a little later on how you're going to deal and how you evolve things. As said in our presentation, if you're like maintaining things aligned with the open standards and if possible use software that is kind of open source, then you should be on the safe side. So open standards are pretty, pretty important and mm. can drive you forward. Um, evolvable architectures are not always everything open sourced and vanilla and, and that's it. 
Yeah. Um, any other questions, comments? I mean, we, we sometimes, actually quite often, at uh, this talk, we have people like sharing their pains and like, oh, yes, I've it's experienced complaints this. complaints talk. So, complaints. Now, okay, so you, since you don't have questions, any complaints, thoughts, you know, feelings, anything? Yeah, we have another question from Andre. Okay, and there is one. What recommendations do you have with Polyglot Cloud Native apps? Ooh. With what recommendations? With Polyglot Open, uh, uh, Cloud Native apps. Polyglot uh. apps, uh, recommendations for that. Hmm. Um, well, I, it's pretty, uh, depending on the size of the platform that you're building, it's, it's achievable. As long as you're working with uh, knowledgeable engineers that know those languages to build the applications. Yeah. It's not, from my point of view, it's not that bad. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're achieving what you wanted to achieve with, overall with your yeah. system, it's, it's not a bad thing. And if you're like thinking on uh, how the, the digital platforms are being built, they're actually a combination of multiple types of architectures, speaking from experience mm -hmm. here. Um, and you're not containerizing, let's say, only Java applications yeah. uh, and only parts built yeah. in Java. Because sometimes you realize that there are better ways to yeah. build something with other programming languages exactly. and you get a better result for that than but, but that's actually a very good just point. using single one. That's actually a very good point. And so for, for those of us who speak more than one language, uh, just think about the way you express yourself in one language and another language. If you translate literally from one language to another, it will sound horribly bad, probably. I mean, it will sound weird, not natural. And uh, the same thing goes with the programming languages, right? So you, you might, I mean, it's fine that you pick another language because it's fun and shiny and all that, but then you need to think, will it kind of impose some restrictions or changes to my architecture? Will it actually make it manageable for like in the long run and all that? So it's a little bit of a balance of giving freedom to choose whatever you want, bring your own language, bring your own platform kind of thing versus, you know, total anarchy and chaos. And those people that, you know, always want the coolest and shiniest thing, they tend, might tend to jump around and move around and go somewhere else and do the same thing. And now you're sitting with 15 languages. You had no idea they existed two weeks ago, and those people who wanted that there might have moved. So, you know, there is a little bit of balance there as well. So you need to think about like different languages, but with microservices, that might be really easy. You can create small, tiny services here and there in different languages. And, you know, if you don't like the language, if it didn't work out, if it didn't think, it will be easier and cheaper to rewrite that tiny little bit instead of like writing the whole thing. So, like I said, the answer is it depends, but, you know. On the long run, um, the components of the teams is going to influence how the platform itself is going to evolve and it's going to be maintained. So if you're like, ha like having s people that know um, a specific programming language just for a little while, um, maybe going polyglot is not feasible, but mm. uh, also not force people to learn a new programming language just because you built something with something yeah. Well, that's to look shiny and nice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why, like choosing an architecture is also depending on the people skill, on the skills of the people that are in the team and how they will adapt in the future to that. We're not like glued to what mm. we're building in terms of software. We're also moving. <laughs> there was a question there. That was a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hello. hello. I just want to share some pains that okay. oh, we have nice. right now. Because <laughs> at the end, uh, for example, one of them is the eternal discussion uh, when you, are, you have to choose. For example, we, we wanted to do infrastructure as code, so we were, uh, we are at Amazon, so we were right choosing between Terraform or CDK. Mm. So it was an eternal discussion about vendor locking because some of uh, some people say, hey, if we choose Terraform, we always have the, the option to change from one cloud provider to the other one. And mm. it was uh, like a hell in the sense of, uh, are you sure are we going to change? Because we mm. are already totally married to, to Amazon. Uh, we are still learning. Uh, so are we going to change uh, uh, at some point in life? So, and it's an eternal discussion. And yeah. apart from that, 
uh, a real problem that we have right now is that it's very cool to have, for example, microservices. But right now, uh, we move it of having a big Oracle to we have like 50 mm. uh, Postgre that we yeah. have to maintain. Yeah. Uh, all the teams need to do major upgrades right now. Yeah. We don't know exactly how to deal with that because yes. at the end, you have 10 microservices. And at some point, Amazon decides, OK, your major version is deprecated. Mm. You have to upgrade. And then what yeah. if you didn't think of uh, doing for resiliency, so your service is not ready to read only or these kind of things. At some point, you have like several teams that need to do DevOps, yeah. and it's like people what doesn't want to do it because they don't want to do on calls, they don't want to, and not not only that, the the, the company doesn't want to pay yeah. everyone to do on calls. Yeah, so exactly. it's like hell in that sense. So. Uh, and, it's difficult. <laughs> and then you have, on top of all that, you have this thing that management wants new features and shiny buttons yeah. instead of actually you polishing that all that. Because they don't, I mean, like, oh, what you've been doing? Oh, we've been up upgrading databases. Well, pff, why do you need to do that? Because, you know, I need this new feature, this new shiny buttons and stuff. Uh, and, you know, I, my users don't see that. So I, as a project manager, might just come to you and say, you know what, this, what, what, what the heck are you spending your time on? You should have been doing that instead of this. And if you're understaffed, which is often is the case, then you have a problem, right? So yes, in the end, it's very difficult just to point the, yeah. the real consequence of choosing one architecture yeah. or one way of doing well, uh, it. Because in the end, you just want the, as everyone, the positive things, no? the positive, uh, <laughs> the advantages. No? Mm. You can do it yourself. You don't need to depend on another team, blah, blah, blah. But when things uh, need to be done, then discussions start exactly. to happen. No? So well, first of all, I'm really sorry to hear that. For all it's worth, I can say one thing. I, don't, I know it's probably not going to help, but I, all it's, for all it's worth, you're not alone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of people are in the same troubles. And the thing like choosing architecture is probably worse than you know, solving partial differential equations that have like several hundreds of variables coming in and out. You have even more, probably, you know, to, to, to choose that. And then you need to tweak and, you know, and figure out and all that. So uh, it's, it's, it's a painful thing. And uh, thank you for sharing. And you know, it's very good that you say it aloud, because I'm pretty sure Anyone else that recognizes the same thing? I mean, yeah, I see a lot of hands, and mine included. It is like that, and it's really hard to do something about it in a way. But I mean, lock-in is usually, can, are we going to move, or how much it will cost us to move? And when it comes to containers, yes, they are nice. They will add you. They will help you with this polyglot thing, for for instance. So you can just run it in tiny little thing in a container. You don't have to have your cloud support that language and stuff. You can just, as long as you can run containers, that will be fine. But then, putting everything in containers, you, it's not. It comes with a cost. Uh, the cost is you still need to manage traffic between all those things. You still need to manage like uh, security between those things. What is the do do like? Uh, 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 no a zero trust kind of thing. Do you do some other kind of security stuff? Do you, how do you, do, do you manage all that network between? How do you do load balancing? How do you do uh, who, which services, which clusters should see other clusters? And it's like, you don't, all those things you don't have to think if you have a big monolith. I'm not saying you should develop monoliths, but I'm just saying that you, know, you get some things good, you get some things less good. Let's put it that way. Any other comments? <laughs> Just saying that I used to like the, the architectures that aren't. I mean, there's no perfect system. But as long as there's a way to move that forward, there's still hope. And that's the idea. So the way to, the way to build thing is like to leave live some, some open window for you to, to move forward. That's, that's the thing. And another thing from my experience, I pretty much love constraints. So whenever somebody was saying, like, you need to do this and this with these constraints, I feel that uh, as an architect, that's the role, or technically, that's the role, like, to evolve something under constraints. Yeah. Now, not block everything, I mean, not do it too many constraints, <laughs> negotiate the constraints. That's another skill to yeah. have. Yeah. But um, 
you know, it kind of um, toughens you up yep. when one bullying stuff. For sure. When you're not having like uh, the situation where you have all the resources in the world uh, uh, generating probably a lot of cost in, and building stuff. At some point, you will want to optimize that because uh, it would be a waste. So my rule of thumb when it comes to these things is always ask why. But somebody comes and you're just like, okay, cool, why? Why do you think it's a good idea? Why do you think that? And why and why and why? And just don't be difficult. Don't be like, be respectful and everything. But ask, like, what, why do you want this new language? Is it just because it's shiny or it actually has some pop pros? And so on and so on and so on. And do All not right. get attached to already built code or already built architecture because yeah. that is not going to be like that for years. It's, I mean, it's not the case anymore with modern architectures. Your end users want something different because look around you, the world evolves, so mm. probably your application has to evolve as well. And it used to be this thing in the past in my team, like people were really attached to their code. So when, <laughs> when, but it's PR, my baby. when PRs were raised, <laughs> I used to have like really interesting conversation convincing senior people like to yes. let it go. And that's how we're going, we're going forward and we're improving it. And I there's their history it. in Git about the good stuff that they yeah, did. But yeah, so like not get too attached. And also as an architect, not get attached to a certain architecture type. Just because it's shiny, you built it right, and then you want to... That's another yep. problem that I've noticed is like people try to, rep, type, try to replicate the same architecture because they've done it once, they know how it goes, and then they want to do it again pretty much not looking mm. about what's in the context. So, yeah. Um, the time is running out. It's really fun to, to, to chat and to talk about this thing. We can continue doing that uh, out in the hallway or, you know, just find us. This is us on the social media on Twitter, so find us there, ping us, and uh, more than happy to chat more with you afterwards, after the talk. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thank you.